Today, I'm joined by Elon Levy, uh, the Israeli government spokesman and London boy, uh, who shot to prominence in the wake of October the 7th. Elon attended University College School and Brazenose College, Oxford, where you read PPE, I believe, Elon. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you went on to take a master's in international relations from Cambridge, uh, specialising in the subject of Jews from the Arab world. Uh, made Aliyah in 2014 at the age of 23, uh, where you served in the IDF, became, became a news anchor before joining the office of President Isaac Herzog as international media advisor. And now, of course, uh, government spokesman and doing a fantastic job um, defending Israel uh, on across the media landscape, international media landscape since that time. So thank you so much for joining us here, Long. We really appreciate you making the time for us. Thank you, Jake. I'm very happy to speak with listeners of the Jewish Chronicle podcast. You missed out the most important biographical detail, uh, which is that my family has a very special connection with the Jewish Chronicle. My late great-grandfather worked at the Jewish Chronicle for 51 years, from the age of 14, fresh out of school in the 1920s, all the way till his retirement as the print manager of the Jewish Chronicle. So the paper's always had a very special place in my family's heart. Astonishing. I mean, we've had one of the things about the Jewish Chronicle is that people often work here for a very long time. We have one member of staff <laughs> who's been here for 60 years. Wow. OK, uh, so he's been in that record. <laughs> yeah. and, and in fact, uh, just as a, as a side note, um, one of the privileges of working for the JC is the long, long history. And that for me is exemplified by the character of Sam Klein, who was born in 1900, joined the JC in 1914 as a postboy in mm -hmm. 1917, 1917 was asked to get on his bike and ride to Downing Street and collect a copy of the Balfour Declaration, which, Extraordinary. Had, been, which had been held for the JC to, to, to break to the world. So that's just the extraordinary privilege of working for the JC. So I'm glad that you could join us uh, uh, today. Thank you so much for doing so. Um, if we can start, Elon, by talking about London uh, and Britain. Mm -hmm. So you've just spent a few days here. Uh, first of all, what was it like coming back to London after the world changed on October the 7th in Israel? Returning to London this time was a surreal experience. I'm used to flying into London for coffee dates with friends and spending every evening in the West End. And this time I'm finding myself zipping back and forth between TV studios in order to defend and explain Israel's conduct in this war. Uh, finding myself suddenly returning as a recognized face, which has its advantages and its disadvantages, uh, to fight a campaign, to fight a campaign to remind the British public of what they knew on October 7th, which is that Israel has a right to win this war. The UK wants Israel to win this war, even as memories of October 7th recede and people are beginning to forget about the hostages who are trapped in the terror dungeons. And... Did How did Britain feel to you? Did it feel like the Britain that you knew or did you feel that something had changed in some way? In some ways, things have changed. I remember back during my student days leading a lot of the pro-Israel activism on campus at Oxford and we managed to defeat a motion that would have aligned the Oxford Student Union with BDS by a, motion of, by a margin of seven to one. Right. That was back in 2013, and it's impossible to imagine the same margin of success happening given uh, how much has changed and how much has been poisoned in public discourse among progressive circles especially, but also among young people. And the juxtaposition was really stark between the hate parades, the pro-Hamas protest in London on Saturday, and the really inspirational rally that we held in Trafalgar Square marking 100 days since the massacre. Because as I, I said in the speech, I said, look, the British public is watching this on a split screen between our display of decency, yesterday's parade of hate, and they can see the differences for themselves because here no one is urging attacks on British targets and forces, calling on the Houthis to attack boats and make us proud, turn another ship around. Here you don't see anyone handing out leaflets glorifying terrorist organizations or storming restaurants. You see a peaceful display of solidarity uh, with a country that has been deeply traumatized and scarred. And part of what I was trying to do in the UK was to remind people of that difference. And the domestic extremism that we are seeing with support for Houthis and Hamas on the streets of London, whether disguised as calls for a ceasefire or whether more explicitly is chilling. And I hope that this is something that British society will treat seriously. 
Because if we thought that this was only a threat to Israel, well, now that you are seeing people on the streets of London calling for Houthi attacks on Britain, it is clear, as always, that what begins with the Jews, what begins with Israel, never ends there. Right, as Rabbi Sachs said, famously. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the things that I've noticed about the protests here is that often they're not really about there, they're about here. You know, for example, we had, we had a sit-in at the Tate of, I think it was art workers for Palestine, disrupting life at the Tate, you know, the, the, the art gallery. And I was thinking, do they really think that Benjamin Netanyahu is going to pick up his phone and say, what, the art workers are on strike? Pull the troops out. <laughs> you know? it's, it's not about that. It's about demonstrating their politics here. Do you think that? What, what do you think about that? That's so true. Uh, throughout history, the character of the Jew has always been something that people have held up against them to try to define themselves against it. There's a wonderful book that I have here on my bookcase, Anti-Judaism by David Nirenberg. I can't find it. It's right behind me, where he tells this fascinating story of 300 years in which there are no Jews in Western Europe, and people are accusing each other of being Jews or Judaizers. If you are capitalist, they are communists. If you're communist, they're capitalist. Nationalist, cosmopolitan. Cosmopolitan, uh, nationalist. It doesn't matter. However societies regard themselves, the Jews are always the counterpoint against which they define themselves. And that means that the argument about Israel often isn't about Israel at all. It is countries projecting their own neuroses, projecting their own fantasies onto Israel. And at the same time, the obsession with Israel is so intense that that feeds back into the culture wars that these countries are having, whether it's the United States, which has its own very painful history of racial oppression, projecting questions of race onto this context where they simply don't apply, or Britain with its legacy of imperialism. I've heard that even some of the hatred that comes towards us from Malaysia has to do with resentment against Chinese migrant workers. Every society around the world ends up projecting those neuroses onto Israel, and that makes it very difficult to fight because what we are fighting is not really about us. It's not about this substance. It's about how this plays into the imaginations of other societies and how anti-Semitism has always been used as a tool by societies to cover up their own failures by finding a bogeyman onto which they can, they can project those problems. I saw just today on Twitter a video, I think from New York, a speaker saying the destruction of the state of Israel, destruction, will be the most positive step we can take on the road towards the destruction of capitalism. Right. And you right. understand that just for each of these people, whatever their neuroses are, Israel just slots straight into place in this narrative that they tell uh, about uh, revolutionary ideologies and, and how they plan to change the world by, by getting uh, Israel or the Jews out of the way first. Right. And on that note, before we talk about the media war, I just wanted to draw on your expertise a little bit of, of the Muslim world and Jews from the Arab and Muslim mm. world. Um, what is your reading of the widespread anti-Semitism within the Muslim world. I mean, it seems to me as if, in a way, the destruction of Israel is a way of reasserting Muslim pride and 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 confidence in their uh, military superiority that's been lost to the West in in the uh, over the last century or two. Um, is that your reading as well? What what are your thoughts on on Muslim anti-Semitism in particular, and can we beat it? I think the fact that Israel is the most successful anti-colonial movement in the world, Zionism as an anti-colonial movement. Right. The only minority in the Middle East from the Zagreb mountains to the Atlas mountains who were able to rise out of the embers of empire and claim their sovereign dignity and independence clearly drives many people in the Muslim world gaga, who are used to thinking of the Jews as being at best protected persons, tolerated minorities, when the Jews stand up and insist on their right to equality, it clearly drives them mad. I think there is a very serious problem of envy, um, Islamic civilization, which has so much to be proud of, looking at how they are being beaten and outpassed by a previously despised minority. I think that's very difficult for them to internalize because there are no other minorities, not the Kurds, not the Druze, no one else in the Middle East able to do that uh, you have to understand and by the way here is where muslim anti-semitism fits very much with traditional christian anti-semitism both being religions that had imagined themselves as being the successors of judaism that had received the last revelation the last truth that had discarded 
previous Jewish civilization to history as being a remnant of a period of ignorance, suddenly seeing that stand up and be more successful and beat them militarily, scientifically, economically, arouses very deep uh, and difficult historical feelings. And that is part of what we are dealing with. The good news is, I think it can be overcome. And we're seeing that with the move towards normalization in the Middle East, with the Abraham Accords, the, the agreements with the UAE, with Bahrain, with Morocco, which have been solid. Saudi Arabia still seems to be moving forward. That there is a desire to move past this, to embrace the future and not be head up on the neuroses of the past. But the role of the Arab-Israeli conflict, and in particular the hold that Jerusalem has, and you see this in all the Houthi propaganda videos, on the Arab imagination, act as a block on being able to move forward towards a better age of peace and prosperity and let go of some of the psychological head-ups of the past. Right. And one of the great ironies is that one of the good news stories coming out of or coming out after October the 7th has been that many uh, Muslim Israelis, Arab Israelis, have actually pulled behind Israel, trying, you know, losing their lives, protecting Jews, saving Jews, fighting in Gaza, standing up. I mean, you know, um, Naz Daly, you know, the, the YouTuber, did that mm -hmm. column for Arets quite early on saying, I used to be Palestinian Israeli. Now I'm Israeli first. And that, I mean, the irony of it is that, that you know, Israel shows what is possible in terms of Muslim-Jewish friendship, but it's lost, it seems to be lost on much of the rest of the world. Absolutely. This is one of the most extraordinary shifts of this war. I won't say surprising, because it's not surprising. Uh, the number of Israeli Arabs who identify proudly as being Israeli has gone up since the start of this war. Now, I saw one commentator on Twitter saying, this is very surprising. And I said, no, this isn't surprising because Arab Israelis looked at the October 7 massacre. They saw the way that they brutalized and slaughtered uh, Arab Israelis as well, took one look at that and said, I want to have absolutely nothing to do with that. Right. It's part of a longer process as well since the Arab Spring and the collapse of neighboring Arab countries that has given a uh, feeling to Arab Israelis that really the best place to live for all its problems is the state of Israel. Uh, and the October 7 massacre shocked them. It shocked them to the core. And so when people say that the backlash that we see in the Arab world or Palestinian society or on the streets of the West among Muslims and Arabs is inevitable because of what Israel is doing. Absolutely not, because clearly the Muslims who live in Israel work with Jewish Israelis, live next to Jewish Israelis, feel very differently about this country and about the prospects for peaceful coexistence. I mean, and I'm very hopeful that, the, that we'll get out of this war after this horrific and, and stinging trauma as a stronger and more solidary society, having been through this experience together. Right, and of course, I should mention uh, Mansour Abbas, uh, who has emerged as a very, I mean, he always was, but a particularly statesman-like leader, the leader of the largest Israeli Arab party. He himself is a conservative Muslim, an, an Islamist. He's not violent in any way, but he's an Islamist. But he has pulled behind Israel, even to the extent where he summarily sacked one of his MKs, who even suggested that some of the October the 7th footage could be fabricated, immediately she was out. That's, pre that's been pretty impressive and important as well, hasn't it? I can't get into partisan political issues or speak right. about particular individuals in this capacity, but we are definitely seeing a shift in rhetoric within Arab society that we haven't seen in previous conflicts. And I think it gives us many reasons to be optimistic. And we can only hope that... Israel's critics outside the country who say they are acting in the name of the Palestinians or the Arabs or the Muslims hear what is happening within Israeli Arab society and ask themselves why. Why is that happening and what can we learn from that? Right. Well, let's move on to something more pessimistic then, um, <laughs> uh, by, by which I mean... Is it the good news is over, Jake? By which I mean the media. So, you know, the media is your is your special subject now, I suppose. You've got more experience than most of, of, of the uh, slings and arrows of the, of the international media. What have been your observations so far, the last 100 days or just over 100 days now, dealing with international media? What are their... What, what are their attitudes? What are their, you know, are there any glimmers of hope? What's the, what, what are the differences between the different countries? What are your general reflections on your experiences so far? Wow, that's a very broad question. Um, the media landscape is very diverse. And even within each channel, 
there can be a huge range between different reporters, different shows. Our challenge is to try to keep the focus on October 7th and the hostages. They are the reason this war is happening. They're not an excuse or something that gives us legitimacy. They are the essential context in which this war is happening. We have a lot of criticism about rushing to accept Hamas figures, not independently verifying information, taking Hamas's word for gospel. I had this argument, argument interview with Krishnan Guru Murthy on Channel 4 just the other day in the studio in London, and he was asking me about these two journalists who were killed in an IDF airstrike. And I explained one of them was a deputy squad commander in the Hamas Gaza City Brigade. The other was an Islamic Jihad terrorist who worked in its electronic engineering unit. He says, but they were journalists. I said, well, according to their Instagram, they were, but Hamas has a history of trying to pass its operatives off as journalists because it knows that you are going to fall for this. Yeah. Uh, so we would like to see more scrutiny from the international media about Hamas's claims. You know, as a journalist, if a source lies to you, you don't take them seriously next time. Hamas has spent every day since October 7th denying that it abducted civilians, even as it released those civilians. Don't take them seriously. Be skeptical about claims that the UN says. Just because a UN official said it doesn't mean that it is true. Um, I found that the British media have been much tougher than the American media. British journalists will often try to pin you on a gotcha moment to try to prove that you don't know something and, and get that as the headline to admit that you don't know something or try to force you into a corner to admit something or deny something. Lots of different interviewers have their own approaches and I'm learning about the different tactics. Some will try to ping pong between different topics, never let you complete an answer, make a statement at the end of your half answer and then zip onto the next question before you have a chance to rebut them. And others will try to latch onto a particular point and flog that dead horse till uh, it's bleeding. Uh, but it is a challenge. It's a challenge to push back, be assertive, use a certain British passive aggressiveness as well in order to push back. I think maybe that's one of the things I've been doing well in this conflict as opposed to previous spokespeople. I speak uh, not only English, British, and I'm able to push back in that same language. But it is a, it's a big challenge and it's a big challenge because, because the, the odds are so stacked against us. Hamas will find that its claims are immediately replicated by UNRWA, other UN agencies that have clearly chosen a side uh, with their complicity with Hamas, a whole repertoire of international organizations, so-called human rights organizations. And so the best sometimes that I can hope for as a journalist is to get a comment in an article, not to shape the story, because when the journalist has 10 other people telling them the opposite of what I'm saying, it's very difficult to convince them that our story is right. Uh, and that is part of the challenge, uh, not just in Israel, but in the United States as well. There is simply a very formidable machine that has built up against us that is pressuring us to end this war in a way that leaves the hostages in Gaza and Hamas still in power when it tells us it wants to do this all over again. And I wanted to focus in particular on the BBC because in Britain, the BBC has really attracted a lot of criticism and controversy, um, partly because it's the state's national broadcaster, it's funded by the licensed payer, and it has a, 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 a char an obligation in its charter towards impartiality. What's your perspective of your engagement with the BBC? How have they come across to you? From your point of view, has it been as, as bad as some as many people perceive it to be from the outside? On the one hand, the BBC has already been forced to apologise three times for its coverage, most famously with the al Ahly hospital incident when they accused Israel of an airstrike that destroyed a hospital and killed 800 people. And by the morning, it turned out it was Islamic Jihad shrapnel. The hospital was still standing and the death toll was much lower. But to be fair, everyone made that same mistake in the media, didn't they? Pretty much at that time or many. Correct. Did, yeah. correct. Correct. And that speaks to a, an industry wide problem about the information coming out of Gaza and how they process that instead of saying, look, the terror organization that just burned, beheaded and raped people and lied about it is saying this. We're going to check it. We'll come back to you later. It became a rolling news story. And then by the time we were able to check the facts, it wasn't, oh, OK, sorry, we made a mistake. They had to spin it into a he said, she said, into a who done it, in order to cover up their earlier mistakes. But with credit to the BBC, they want to hear Israel's voice. 
And I have personally done around 30 interviews for the BBC, and I'm not alone. I think Ambassador Mark Gregev has probably done just as many, if not uh, more. Uh, we think that they need to do a better job of pushing back against the Palestinian narrative. I had an interview with BBC Newsnight straight off the back of an interview with Mohammed Steyer, the Palestinian Authority Prime Minister, who was presented as a moderate politician and supporter of the two-state solution. And I started the interview, I said, I, I don't know whether you heard, he just said the Palestinian people have been fighting by every way and means for the last 100 years. That's 25 years before the establishment of the State of Israel and long before 67. And the presenter, I think it was Kirsty Walk, says, I think he said 56 years. I said, no, please rewind your own interview. He has been telling you that he has been waging this war against us since before the birth of the State of Israel or what you now call the occupation. You need to listen to their words and push back on them. And we find that there is unfortunately a trust deficit and a greater willingness to accept the Palestinian narrative, the Palestinian framing, to demand a much lower burden of proof for claims that they present than what Israel is presenting and the story that Israel is putting forward. Now, just to move, to broaden that out uh, a little bit, back to British society, we began talking about that. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of um, anxiety amongst the Jewish community in Britain. Um, there's a lot of uh, animosity, particularly on campuses, towards Jewish students. Mm -hmm. um, people are worried and afraid in the street and so forth. Um, I think a lot of parents are trying to draw inspiration from examples like you to tell their kids, be like Elon. Um, it's difficult. Uh, what's your view of, of, of the situation in the diaspora since October the 7th? I mean, is, do, you, do you see that the future of Jews here is, has been compromised? The situation is grim. There's no way to paper over it. We saw protests beginning on October 8th, glorifying the Hamas atrocities, celebrating them. Famously, the protest on the steps of the Sydney Opera House straight after the massacre, chanting, gas the Jews, gas the Jews. Uh, those protests glorifying the atrocities quickly turned into denying the atrocities and then projecting them onto Israel, because that's how people deal with cognitive dissonance and they don't want to admit what their Hamas heroes did. And that has escalated into calls for attacks on Britain as well, with the cries, "Who Yemen, Yemen, make us proud, turn another ship around. It has been horrifying to see people chanting for intifada and jihad on the streets of London. London has already had a taste of Intifada. That was the 7-7 bombings. It's had a taste of Jihad. That was the Manchester Arena bombings. Uh, and we hope that British society will understand the level of the domestic extremism threat and the amount of sympathy that exists for us. And part of what I was trying to do in this mini media tour of the UK was not only to present information to make Israel's case, but also a boost of morale and motivation for British Jewish society to fight for its place and fight for its voice. Because there is a very large campaign of violent intimidation that is trying to make it impossible for British Jews, for anyone to speak in support of Israel, make it socially unacceptable. And we know that the large majority of British people are fundamentally decent and very good and know that this terror organization cannot emerge on its two feet after the massacre that it perpetrated. And we need people to speak loudly. Um, it is still the policy of the British government that Israel should win this war. The problem is there, the people opposing that are very loud, very vocal and very intimidating. And the leaders who want Israel to win this war, not because they're doing us a favor, but because that is essential for Britain's national security interests, need to hear the same forcefulness of people insisting on that right as well for Israel to bring back the hostages and bring Hamas to justice. Because otherwise, if they look around and all they see is people calling Israel a warmongering, genocide, child-eating state, that is all they will hear, and, and maybe, maybe they will succumb to that uh, pressure. So, so we need people to 
realize that they have a voice, they have influence, and to speak up because that storm isn't going to pass. The storm is not going to pass if you keep your heads down or try to find comfort in the arms of the mob. It's never worked in history. It's not going to work now. Uh, in Israel, nothing will ever be the same after October 7th. And I hope that this is going to be a moment that will strengthen Israel diaspora solidarity and cooperation and strengthen resolve within diaspora communities to fight for their place and fight for their voice because they have a right uh, and should settle for nothing less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just before we turn to questions from uh, from from our guests here, all of whom, by the way, are JC super readers. That's why we invited them. Um, I just wanted just to turn to uh, to geopolitics a little bit and to the future. What's next? Um, the big question is uh, the north is Hezbollah. Um, my reading of it is that in Israel, most people uh, accept that there probably will be a war with Hezbollah because the threat isn't going away by itself. And October the 7th taught everybody what happens when a threat doesn't go away, you try to contain it. Um, what's what's What can you tell us about the next few months, about the North in particular, and about what people can prepare for or expect? Immediately after the October 7 massacre, Hamas decide, Hezbollah decided to join this war on the side of Hamas. It started launching rockets at northern Israel, shelling houses, and as a result, 80,000 people have been displaced, and they can't go back to homes that are being shelled. Just the other day, two people were killed from, I think, an anti-tank missile. They had to be buried in the dark in the middle of the night in a hurried fashion because the border has been rendered completely uninhabitable. Now, for three months, we have been warning that we do not want a war on two fronts. We don't want to fight, but we're ready to fight if we have to. Our policy is to destroy Hamas and aggressive deterrence in the north against Hezbollah. But now we are warning that we are at a fork in the roads. Enough is enough, and this situation has to end with a very clear change. And we are warning Hezbollah, back off or we will push you away. And if we push you away, the consequences for Hezbollah as a terrorist organization for Lebanon as a state and for Iran as a regime will be severe. We still hope it is possible to reach a diplomatic resolution based on UN Security Council resolutions and international law. And notice how suddenly that doesn't interest anyone as soon as it comes to Israel's favor. The 2006 Second Lebanon War ended with UN Security Council Resolution 1701, which orders Hezbollah to go north of the Litani River. Hezbollah has treated that with contempt. It never moved its forces. It fires from meters away from UNIFIL positions and has rendered that resolution effectively null and void. Now we're saying we don't want a war. You say you don't want a war. So let's enforce that resolution. Move away from the border. Because until then, every moment is October 6th. Right. Every moment is October 6th. We cannot take the risk of anyone being abducted into Lebanon. You understand what that means? They could be in Iran by the afternoon. So we want Hezbollah to push, uh, to go away so that our people can return to their homes. Now we want to avoid a war. We understand how damaging a war could be when Hezbollah has an arsenal of 150,000 rockets, many precision guided with much heavier explosive power than Hamas. And if only 5% get through the Iron Dome, that can still cause very serious damage. So we want a diplomatic resolution. We strongly favor that. But we will not reconcile ourselves in the absence of that with a reality in which the first miles away from the Israeli border are completely uninhabitable and those people will never return to their homes. They will. Israeli territory will not be a buffer zone against terrorist controlled territory just over the border. Right. And further afield, Iran, of course, is, as Natalie Bennett put it, the head of the octopus that's controlling mm -hmm. all these tentacles, including the Houthis. Mm -hmm. And we've seen some quite uncharacteristic um, muscle from Britain and America uh, in the Red Sea towards, uh, towards the Houthis. Do you feel that this signifies a change of stance on Iran? I mean, it's since Biden came to office, it's been remarkably soft on Iran. Uh, and as a result, it's been played for fools in the nuclear progress is more advanced than it ever has been before. In my view, uh, a much more aggressive stance is needed to deter Iran. Do you think that we're going to be seeing that following our newly found teeth against the Houthis? We would agree that a much more assertive stance is required against Iran. The problem is not only Iran's race towards nuclear weapons, 
but it's imperial project of sowing chaos around the Middle East as a way of extending its control. Now we find ourselves at a fascinating moment where the UK and the US are in conflict with one Iranian proxy, the Houthi pirate regime. We are in conflict with another Iranian proxy, the Hamas rapist regime, both funded and trained and supported by Iran. And we hope that this will serve as a fillip for Western governments and Western audiences to understand the chess pieces on the international chessboard, that on the one side you have the Houthi pirates and Hamas rapists, on the other side you have Israel and the United Kingdom, and it is obvious where you stand when those are the battle lines in international security. Now the Houthi question is separate, they're doing a very good PR job of trying to link it specifically to Gaza because they understand how that plays within Western media. They're playing a sophisticated game there. Uh, the attacks on international shipping are a threat to global trade, and it is correct that the response there should be global. But we certainly hope that with these very unfortunate attacks on international shipping and British and American targets, people will understand that we are on the same side in the fight for international peace and security, and that the same violence that we are seeing from Hamas and that they are seeing from the Houthis, there is a common address. That common address is in Tehran, and that has to be dealt with together. Right, here, here. So just before I turn over to um, to other questions, I just wanted to ask you one more personal question. How are you doing, Elon? I mean, it must have been a, a pretty big, big three months for you. How have you coped? Uh, this has been the longest three months of my life. Uh, but I'm in a much better state than many people in this country. Israel is a very small country. So 1,200 people murdered, 250 people abducted means you are never more than two degrees of separation away from someone who was killed or, or brutally ripped away from us on October 7th. I'm very fortunate that none of my friends or family are in the immediate circle of people who are affected. Um, and my challenge is the challenge of uh, stamina, of fighting this fight in the international media. We have been doing this for three months. It was a sprint. We're now having to adjust to making it a marathon and adjusting to the new normal of the intensity. Uh, but what keeps us going, what keeps me going, the incredible team of volunteers who are working with me, mostly uh, diaspora Jews who've made Aliyah, is the understanding of what the stakes are, uh, understanding what the stakes are of this war. And I don't want to be too dramatic, but if we lose this, we're all going to die. I mean, those are, those are the stakes when we are fighting a terror regime that thinks it is going to emerge from the bloodiest massacre of Jews since the Holocaust on its feet with the international community behind it. And so the information campaign that we are waging is absolutely critical to making sure that Israel emerges from this war that we have to win, not only victorious, but with our friendships and alliances intact around the world. And I have to say that for me personally, Although Twitter is an absolute cesspit and the number of threats, intimidating remarks, uh, violent comments I get there is astronomical, but the number of messages of support I get, not only from Israelis, diaspora Jews, other friends of Israel around the world, really uh, help me with the motivation to keep going and remember that we are fighting the good fight and we have a lot, a lot of good people behind us. Good, in including all of our readers, um, as uh, uh, which is uh, a not insubstantial number. Thank you. Uh, right, uh, Elon. So let's turn to um, questions from some of our attendees. Um, what, one question is, the first question is that, do you think more could be made of the fact that Hamas, in funneling so much money into building its terror infrastructure, this infamous metro of horrendous tunnels under Gaza, haven't made a single bomb shelter for a single civilian since 2007. Do you think more could be made at that point? And what, and what does it say, do you think? Absolutely, and we are trying to make that point. I visited one of the Hamas terror tunnels just last week. Uh, it's a tunnel just 400 meters away from the Israeli border. It's the width of a tube train and the length of the stretch of the Northern Line from Camden Town to Waterloo. And when you go in there, you say it's just extraordinary how much concrete was poured into the tunnels underground 
uh, instead of above ground, instead of going to people's homes, they went into the tunnels that are connected through shafts into children's bedrooms in those homes. And we hope that supporters of Palestinians around the world as well, even though they don't really want to listen to us now, will understand that Hamas has brought the Palestinian people nothing but misery and has systematically oppressed them and subjugated them and subordinated the Gaza Strip for 16 years in the service of its war machine. Because Gaza's problem has never been resources. It had the resources. Its problem is priorities. And they chose to prioritize the October 7th massacre. And we hope that the day after Hamas, whoever governs the Gaza Strip, and we want it to be governed by Palestinians, we have no intention of permanently reoccupying Gaza, will be serious about making sure that concrete goes to people's homes and not the tunnels underneath those homes. Because the Palestinians still have the international goodwill and the resources and the donations that they are receiving. But it will require them to make a switch. It will require them to make a switch and realize that terrorism is a dead end. Uh, there's no light at the end of that tunnel. And that their best hopes of peace and prosperity are to learn to live next to Israel and work with it rather than trying to replace it and subordinate the whole of their civilian fabric, literally subordinate the whole of their civilian fabric towards the goal of perpetual war against the Jewish people. Right. And I mean, our next question is about the day after. Uh, does Israel know what's going to happen next? And you've talked about um, about how Israel has no intention to reoccupy Gaza. I've noticed uh, on Twitter, in the media, in the discourse here in Britain, that there have been some elements, I suppose you can't really speak to this specifically, but some extremist elements in Israel, people who've spoken loudly demanding a reoccupation of Gaza. Israeli policy has been consistent, no reoccupation of Gaza. And yet the voices that are heard most loudly or that the observers in the West choose to latch onto are the extremists. They try to characterize Israel as a whole by those few fringe voices. Um, what do you think about that that says about us? And I suppose what's coming next for Gaza? We're a vibrant democracy with many ministers, with many opinions, not all of which reflect government policy and what matters at the end of the day is official government policy and the statements of the prime minister, the defense minister, and those who are directly responsible for the prosecution of this war. Uh, we've been clear, we have no interest in reoccupying Gaza. We gave Gaza to the Palestinians in 2005. And the reason we are having this war now is because we tried to do everything possible not to have this war. There were voices calling on Israel to go in and topple Hamas, but we knew what the cost would be in blood and treasure on both sides. And so we said, let's try to find a way to live next to the Hamas terror regime, to deter it, to put up tough defenses against it. And that conception failed. That conception failed on October 7th. We don't want to reoccupy Gaza. We will need to exercise ultimate security control over Gaza. And that's not because we think it's fun to send 18 year old kids who should be going to college, put them in the army and force them to exercise security control over another territory. It's simply because there is no other option, because it's not going to be Hamas. It's not going to be the Palestinian Authority that can barely control Janine. It's not going to be a paper tiger UN force that will fail as miserably as it has in Lebanon. So who is it going to be? Uh, we are going to have to take responsibility for that, to make sure that the border with Egypt cannot be used to smuggle weapons, to make sure that no one can approach the border and surprise us with an attack like they did on October 7th. But we hope that we are going to not only provide security for Israel, but also new opportunities for Palestinians and local community leaders who understand that the experiment of the Hamas regime has brought them only misery, and that there really is a real and viable option for prosperity in the Gaza Strip if they truly choose to engage with it. Right. Uh, two more questions here um, that we've got so far. Uh, the first is, were you surprised, surprised by the speed with which the mobs came out onto the streets after October the 7th? Did that surprise you? Yes. Um, and yes. the te tearing down of hostage posters as well. Did that <sighs> come as a surprise to you? Uh, I think we hadn't realized just how bad 
the situation was. For many people, the October 7th massacre gave them the thrill of their lives. The tearing down of hostage posters is particularly shocking, and I know for many people in Britain, it has been traumatic to discover that many of their neighbors, who they thought were perfectly ordinary people, are in fact happy tearing down posters of kidnapped children. It speaks to decades of an ideological movement that has built up universities in the streets unchallenged. I hope there will be a pushback. That pushback and the swinging of the pendulum will not be too dramatic because that never ends well for us either, but definitely the beginning against uh, the beginning of uh, pushback and understanding the link between anti-Israel sentiment and anti-Semitism. And it's not, there is legitimate criticism of Israeli government policy and sometimes it spills over into anti-Semitism because they get carried away with themselves and go too far. And it's not a question of anti-Semites using legitimate anti-Israel activity as cover. It is that much of the opposition to Israel is motivated by pure anti-Semitism. There is no other way to explain the total dehumanization of Jews and Israelis that is necessary to tear down the poster of a little two-year-old who is a hostage in Gaza. These two are interlinked. There is no dividing line between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. Anti-Zionism, not as an idea, as a modern political movement, is driven at its core by a violent opposition to Jews and to the one solution that the Jewish people have found collectively to ensuring their security. And, uh, and it is disturbing to see not only that, not only the celebrations of the atrocities, the total silence of institutions that uh, we would have expected to speak out about them has left a lot of people feeling betrayed. And the way that there is now a large and concerted campaign essentially to give Hamas a stay of execution and make sure that it survives these atrocities. And I keep getting back to this same point when I get pushed back in interviews by calling the marches through the streets of London, pro-Hamas marches. They say, no, they're not pro-Hamas marches. They're calling for a ceasefire. I said, look, everyone except for the most violent extremists wants the fighting to end. The question is on what terms? We want the fighting to end on terms that we get the hostages back home and Hamas brought to justice so it can never do October 7th again. You want the fighting to end immediately after Hamas did the October 7th massacre, letting us abandon the hostages and leave Hamas free to do it again. So yes, you're giving political and legal cover to Hamas. These are pro-Hamas marches, because if you seriously cared, if your concern was seriously for civilians, you would be demanding that Hamas surrender. And the fact that people aren't doing that, are happy to let Hamas get away with the massacre, cover up the evidence of that massacre, project it onto Israel, deny it, it doesn't matter, speaks to a very deep sickness that connects to decades and centuries of anti-Semitism. That's right. I mean, two two quotes that came to mind while you were talking were firstly from Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, the late chief rabbi, who said that in the Middle Ages, Jews were hated for their religion. In the mm -hmm. 20th century, they were hated for their race. And now they're hated for their nation state, the state of Israel. Uh, and the other is Howard Jacobson more recently said um, that anti-Zionism means I don't hate Jews individually. I only hate them by the country. <laughs> exactly. And, and that gets to, you know, the famous incident with uh, Kay Burley and the eyebrows, which was... Right. I was going to talk about the eyebrows. Let's, let's, talk, <laughs> let's, let's talk eyebrows. Let's no, talk no, 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 the, the moment that sort of pro propelled me to a sort of fame. <laughs> the reason that that went viral in Israel... I let's just recap what it is, out. because just in case there's people who haven't seen it. So just tell us what happened first and then tell us that. I was uh, doing an interview with uh, Kay Burley. It wasn't our first interview. And this was during the release of the hostages when Israel famously agreed to release three violent criminals from jail in exchange for every one hostage. And Kay said, I was speaking to a hostage negotiator this morning and he suggested, does the fact that Israel is willing to release three prisoners for every one hostage mean that Israel attaches less value to Palestinian lives? And in response, it doesn't matter what my answer was, the fact is that I pulled a face and sent my eyebrows so high up, they almost shot out of the screen. 
Um, now, I don't, you can tell me why that moment hit a nerve in the diaspora. The, the reason that it hit a nerve in Israel, and within an hour there were push notifications on all the Israeli news sites, was that there is a feeling in Israel that sometimes it literally does not matter what we do or what we say, there are always going to be people who are going to turn it against us. It reminds me of the accusation I heard a few years ago from someone's doctoral thesis that the reason that Israeli soldiers don't rape Palestinian women is because they've dehumanized them. It's because they're racist. Okay, so sometimes it literally doesn't matter what we do or what we say. There are people who have this fixed narrative in their head and are always going to twist it uh, against us. And people appreciated the moment of the eyebrows because it it was just a very visual expression of how absurd not only that question is, but the whole line of thinking that holds Israel ultimately responsible for everything that is wrong in the world, no matter what we do. And that links into the statements you said from um, the late Chief Rabbi, uh, Lord Jonathan Sachs, who I miss terribly, and uh, Howard Jacobson uh, as well. Well, I'm going to come to our final question now. It's, I'm going to wrap the last two together, actually. The first one is a serious question about The Hague. Um, if The Hague does rule against Israel um, uh, and find it guilty of genocide, which would be the most absurd sort of um, surreal situation, can Israel simply ignore it? What will it mean for Israel? And then the second question, just to finish off after that, is... How many of you are there? Because it seems that you have endless energy and are on Twitter at the same time as doing interviews. How many of you are, how many really are there of you? And how do you possibly relax? <laughs> hey, hey um, first. <laughs> look, the, the, this despicable stunt that South Africa is pulling at The Hague is really absurd. And that's not us saying it, it's the free democracies of the world saying it. It's why the UK has called South Africa's statement completely unjustified and wrong, why the United States has said that it is meritless and particularly galling, given that uh, those South Africa are defending are the ones trying to perpetrate genocidal acts. And it's why Germany, which knows a thing or two about genocide, has said that if it comes to it, it will send a representative to argue Israel's side. It was Hamas that perpetrated an act of genocide on October 7th, and South Africa is now acting as the legal arm for Hamas to shield it from the consequences of that massacre by projecting those same accusations onto Israel. Now, let's wait and see what happens. The first thing that is going to happen with the ICJ ruling is not going to be a statement, genocide, yes or no, but a ruling on the provisional orders that South Africa is asking for. And if it doesn't throw the case out, which we expect it to, because of course it's completely ridiculous, uh, that could launch a very long trial at the end of which the court will almost certainly rule uh, that, that, uh, that the claim is meaningless, but the damage will have been done by years of having shifted the Overton window about what people think this conflict is about. Now let's wait and see what the court is going to rule in the provisional orders. Personally, I struggle to believe that any court of justice is going to order Israel to abandon the hostages in the hands of Hamas, because that is what it would mean if the court were to take the nuclear option of telling Israel to suspend its campaign and leave Hamas standing. I can't imagine that happening. Uh, that seems really far-fetched to imagine a court of justice could do that and say that to the parents who are sitting there in the courtroom. Uh, but let's wait and see. We put up a stellar performance. We had representing us not only the inimitable Tal Becker from the Foreign Ministry and other great lawyers, but Sir Malcolm Shaw, Professor Malcolm Shaw, Casey, who literally wrote the textbook on international law. He also literally wrote the suggested reading on the Red Cross website about international law and genocide. They misquote him, they call him Martin. Never mind, that shows uh, some of the Red Cross's sloppy approach to international law. Uh, and on the other side, they had Jeremy Corbyn. So we know that we put up and systematically demolished in a completely disproportionate and indiscriminate manner South Africa's accusations at the uh, Hague, and we accept the court to, to throw it out. As for how many of me there are, there is only one of me, I'm afraid. It would be nice if I had a twin and could take a uh, weekend. Um, I'm, I'm running on fumes of adrenaline and caffeine. Um, and remember that ultimately, my situation is so much better than others who are, you know, in there on the front lines. You don't see them, 
because they're not on CNN, they're not on BBC. But I went down to the Gaza tunnels just a week ago and met the soldiers who were recuperating from the latest tour in Gaza. And I asked, how long do you go in for? They said, two weeks at a time. I said, where do you sleep? They said, in the tank. I said, surely not while you're in operational activity. And they say, well, we take turns. And sometimes the tank is in action and, and you sleep. Nice. Uh, I mean, this is a nation of everyday heroes, people who before October 7th had perfectly ordinary lives. They're working in high tech, they're waiters, they're tour guides, doesn't matter. And they're plucked out, put uniform on them. They look like action men and sent into battle. But these are perfectly normal people. They're friends and family. And they're the real heroes uh, who are fighting with incredible stamina because they and we know what we are fighting for and it's for the basic right to be a free people in our own country and to sleep in our beds without fear that we're going to be massacred or abducted so everyone understands why we are fighting what the stakes are for why we're fighting and that's why despite the pain and trauma of october 7th israeli society really is united in a way that i've never seen it ever uh, around a determination with a strong sense of justice to continue prosecuting this war to bring back the hostages and bring Hamas to justice. Very well, Elon, thank you once again for joining us. Uh, thank you so much, Jake. Um, of course, needless to say, we're all 100% behind you. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. For everybody who's who's um, attended and participated. I'm so, so I saw somebody complaining I'd misinterpreted their question. I'm sorry about that. It was, wasn't intentional. Um, and finally, uh, anybody who's viewing this on YouTube, it's also on the podcast. Anyone who's listening on the podcast, it's also on YouTube. So, Elon, good luck with the next few months. I'm hoping to see you, Jake. See you in London soon. Yes, I'll be back sooner rather than later. Thank you very much, Jake. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.